All right. So we'll kind of circle back just a little bit. If you just want to introduce yourself, uh, we'll probably have some people popping in as we go along. But um, just tell us a little bit about your background and, uh, you know, your experience and kind of how you ended up at Wheaton. Yeah. So I'll try to I'll try to sum that because that is a long story because it starts with my parents getting divorced and ends with me at Wheaton College. Right. Um, so to kind of fill in the gaps, I started wrestling when I was 11 years old. I got into a fight with somebody, lost the, I was winning the fight, popped him in the face like three times, thought I'd won, and then he double-legged me and beat me up. And then his dad came out and beat him up because he's 50 pounds heavier than me. And then later on, you know how kids are, that one second you're best friends, next second you're fighting, and then you're back to being best friends again. He invited me to like a six-week wrestling clinic, and so I started wrestling. At mm -hmm. the end of the six weeks, there was a match. I lost it three to two. I remember it to this day. And it really just fired me up. And I fell in love with the sport. And then after a year of football, realizing you're 90 pounds dripping wet, mm -hmm. you're not going to be a really good running back. And also, I was like third string on a freshman B team. Um, you also know that your, your glory days are not going to be in wrestling. So I, or excuse me, in football. So I just stuck with wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, year to year, it just kept on growing and getting better. Uh, you know, was at one school my freshman year, transferred halfway through from Mugwanago, Wisconsin, to Greendale, Wisconsin, stayed there for the next few years and was a three-time state finalist, won it my junior year, lost to Dennis Hall in the finals my senior year, and that started a 15-year rivalry, um, a 15-year rivalry where I'm like 7-16 and 16 overall against them. So not a great record, but my last, I think the last nine matches, I'm 6-3 and three against them. So it got better. I lost to him for 11 years in a row. So if you're a kid out there who's lost to the same guy a lot of times, I get it. Stay strong, persevere. Mm -hmm. um, my family went from being kind of nominal believers to really agnostics to um, uh, we went to a church that was kind of like a hyper extra biblical, independent, fundamental Bible believing Baptist mm -hmm. to now I'm in a place where uh, what I would call a common sense Christian where the Bible has an answer just for everything. So um, I was at an Olympic training center for 12 years. And then I was at another Olympic training center for four years as an athlete slash coach. I thought I was done competing and then athletes weren't getting the job done. I jokingly, semi jokingly said, either start getting better. Or I'm going to come out of retirement. They said, whatever old man. And I said, I'll show you old man. So I won the nationals in 2008 and then dislocated my shoulder and had my second shoulder surgery and then went back to coaching and then really felt a strong calling some Wheaton alum. Mm -hmm. the, the wrestling program had been on the chopping block for like three times over 10 years. And the alum said, we, we're not going to let you cut the program. I don't know what was said behind closed doors, but basically they approached me and said, hey, would you be interested in coaching at Wheaton? Mm -hmm. I went down there. My wife and I prayed about it. We said, this looks like a good environment for our family and good environment for us. People thought I'd lost my mind coaching at the Olympic level and then coming to a D3 program that kind of sucked. Um, but we don't suck anymore. So that's the good part about it. We've got a thriving program. I feel like God's blessing the program. Um, I know that I know that I can be replaced. So that's the attitude I take wherever I go. I know that I can be replaced. And so it always kind of keeps me on the edge of what can I do so they don't try to replace me. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of my journey from my kid summed up in like what, five minutes of being a kid to being at Wheaton College and and watching the program um, get better. We're not we're we're not there yet. I'm one of those people that don't think that you've ever arrived, so I'm not there yet. I won't ever get there until I die. And then I'll be in heaven and then I'm there. But until then, I'm going to see, keep seeking perfection, settling for excellence. So, yeah, that's how I got to Wheaton. Awesome. And obviously been there for the last 12 years now, right? Yeah, I'll start my 12th year of coaching, which will tie me for the third longest coach there. Uh, wow. George Olson coached for a little over 30 years. Pete Wilson coached for about 28 years. Mm -hmm. And Seth Norton and I are, are tied now with 12 years, if I can get through this season. without That's, that. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. then obviously in that time too, you know, you, um, you mentioned earlier, you have uh, seven children. <laughs> yeah, seven so kids. You, on top of, you know, trying, you know, keeping that going, keeping the program going, and then obviously, you know, balancing that, you know, what, is it like kind of with that balancing act, especially now too, during this pandemic, you know, you got such a large family, a large household to kind of manage. What's that kind of been like, you know, how have you been able to keep yourself busy and, and kind of help keep the household going? So, yeah. So when you've got seven kids and a wife and a job, you're never not busy. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, my kids, sometimes they'll say I'm bored. I'm like, I got an answer for boredom. It's a work, you know? Yeah. And so they know now that they don't say they're bored around me because I'm going to give them something to do. But um, you, used, you used a term, and that's something that I've kind of fight, fight against, the, the idea of balance, right? Because when I hear balance, I think of, oh, okay, well, if I, if I do enough good, it'll balance out the bad in my life. And so I've never been someone to live a balanced life. I think a balanced life is actually a bad way of living your life. What I call it is I want to be an all-in life. And, uh, and I'll give you an example. When I'm with the wrestlers, I can't be thinking about my wife and kids right? Mm-hmm. I've got to be thinking about the wrestlers. But in the same respect, when I'm at home, I can't be bringing my work home. Or again, that's going to disrupt the time that I have with my kids. And my kids are going to feel like they're getting the short end of the stick, or my athletes will feel like they're getting the short end of the stick, or my wife will. And right. so when I'm with my athletes, I'm all in. Mm-hmm. When I'm doing office monkey work in my office, I'm all in. When I'm with my kids, I'm all in. When I'm with my wife, I'm all in. So I try to keep an all-in mentality. Wherever I am, you're going to get 100% of me because that's all I can ever give in any one moment. So that's how I, I stay sane and I juggle all the balls that I have uh, mm-hmm. that I need to juggle. I'm just all in wherever I am. Like right now, I'm not thinking about my wife and my kids. I'm thinking about I'm in this Zoom call. I'm going to be all in in this Zoom meeting. So these guys get all of me mm-hmm. and they know that I'm not distracted by something going on here or here. I'm focused on the questions and the answers. Right. That's definitely a really interesting way to think about it because that's, you know, that's a perspective that obviously we try and get and communicate with the kids as well that you know, I've, I've been coaching for 10 years now, and that's kind of one thing I heard early on in my coaching career is that, you know, those days that you're kind of dragging, you just want to think, I don't want to be anywhere else. I'm here right now. This is what I'm focusing on. This is what I want to do. So that's another interesting way to think about it, how to just apply that then to your life as well, because I know that's usually something, especially with student athletes, you know, all the way through from elementary through high school and into college, that that's something that they try and figure out how to do as well. So that's a really powerful message there. That's yeah, it. and it works for kids, too. Think about it. When they're in the classroom, they can't be thinking about the state tournament or mm-hmm. the next match, right? right. they got to be focused on learning because if they yeah. don't, they're going to fail in the classroom, and then they're not going to be able to wrestle. So that idea that they were thinking about wrestling 24-7 because they want to get better, well, you can't get better if, if you're if, if you're going to compete. You know, same thing. If you ain't getting the sleep that you're supposed to at night, if you're not all in on getting a good night's sleep, it's going to affect who you are as a wrestler. So even sleep, you got to be in all in. When you eat, you've got to be all in on the eating. You can't just rush through it. That's a terrible way, and we know scientifically. So all these little things, and again, when they're in the wrestling match, they can't be worried about what's happening in the classroom because they're going to donkey stomped in practice or they're going to get donkey stomped in a tournament. Mm-hmm. You just got to learn to be all in where you are. And then, and then what that does is, is if you do that and you do it well, Mm-hmm. You don't, I'm not saying you're a straight-A student, but I'm just saying if you do it and you do it well, you're going to make the grades that you need. You're going to be the best version of yourself in the classroom. You're going to be the best version of yourself in the wrestling room. You're going to be the best version of yourself at your job mm-hmm. or walking some little old lady across the street. Because if you're not all in walking someone across the street, it's one of those things in life you can't be 99.9%. Well, that's an A. Not walking across the street, it's not. You're either 100% or you're dead, right? So I figure why not take that? Mm-hmm to everything else just be all in so you know and obviously this year with the pandemic and things getting canceled you know you had a national qualifier as well so in relation to that message and then also you know how you try and find the good in what happened you know um how would you kind of communicate that and how did you communicate that once the pandemic hit and things kind of got canceled that's a great question because i we were we had had our coaches meeting. They told us the NCAA tour was still going to happen. So it's 3.30. We got weigh-ins 9 o'clock the next morning. We're competing 11 o'clock, right? Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, we get back to the hotel 15 minutes after our last meeting. Text, national tournament canceled. Are you kidding me? Kids have been working out, losing weight, getting things ready, sharpening their skills. Parents are there. Everybody's there. It doesn't make a difference if we run the tournament. No one's going to get any more sick right? And especially now that we know some of the data on it, and I'm not going to make a comment one way or another, but it was brutal. You had grown men crying. And then I, I jumped in the car with my, uh, my assistant coach because the goofy thing was, is my athlete actually got hurt that Tuesday before. So I went through that loss of the national tournament the Tuesday before this all happened where I'm holding this kid crying and I'm saying, listen, man, you're more than wrestling. This doesn't define you. 
you know, this is a, this is a part of the sport. It's a crappy part of the sport, but it happens. So I'd already kind of gone through the grieving process, you know, that five stages of grief. Mm -hmm. So on my way back, I'm already driving. I'm 45 minutes and I get a call from another coach saying, I need you around my guys right now. They need to be around you. They need, you, you got to pray with them. You got to talk with them. Like, dude, I'm already on my way back. Mm -hmm. So I spent the next hour just talking with my assistant coach, praying, asking God to give me wisdom. And so I ended up writing something. I'm going to actually read that do. right real quickly right here. So this is what I sent to him. I said, men, many of you are hurting right now, frustrated, tears, anger. Some went through, the, uh, you know, some went through this two weeks ago when an athlete or athletes didn't make it to nationals. I went through it two days ago when my only national choir fire injured his knees in the last five minutes of practice. He's getting surgery tomorrow. But that is wrestling. We get winning and losing. We get injuries. We know that upsets happen and injuries happen. We comfort our guys and move on. This is a part of coaching. Yet when a small, faceless group makes decisions to end the season the day before wrestling begins, the frustration and subsequent anger is based on a helplessness that goes well beyond the unwanted but understandable bad to terrible moments of wrestling. This is next level frustration and anger. When my guy was hurting, he cried and I held him. I let him know that I believed in him. I believed in him and his ability to get beyond this terrible moment because he is more than a wrestler and more than nationals. My encouragement to you is this. Do not let this moment rob you. And this is the key of everything that you just asked. The question is, this, this next point is, do not let this moment rob you of the joy of coaching. This is a big moment for all coaches across the country, college, any level possibly the biggest moment of your coaching career because we talk about that journey all the time right and mm -hmm. so now we have to walk it we got to live it and let our guys know that this is the moment how are you going to respond to something totally out of your control your athletes are watching you and, and and their response will be yours but scaled in degree if you respond in anger they will rage use this as a teaching moment comfort them encourage them i believe in you as a coach because most, if not all of you, love your guys if they are your sons. I believe in you because you are more than the national tournament. You are coaches and mentors. You are the father to the fatherless. You are builders of men and you are awesome. So that's what I sent out in an email to all 100 and some D3 wrestling coaches and it met with a real positive response because it put everything into perspective. What happened with COVID sucked. We lost a chance at nationals, but you wanna know what? For some people, this is a key moment in their coaching. What is your identity really? Is, is it really about the journey? Mm -hmm. That's what we preach to our guys all the time, right? We tell it to our kids, I know it sucks to be lost. You didn't make the state tournament, but it's the journey. It's, this is making you a better version of yourself. Well, as coaches, we got kind of called on it now. We had to live those words because we just lost. And I understand coaching is a rough sport. It's rough mm -hmm. because your identity, whether it's 14 to 18-year-olds, or 18 to 22 year olds, you're, at, you're, you're being judged on the actions of 18 to 20 year olds as a college coach. And if they don't go to nationals, you can be the greatest coach in the world, but if your guy picks a bad day to have a bad day, people are gonna look at you and say, hmm, is this guy really that good of a coach, right? And that sucks as a coach because you could do just about everything right and the kid breaks his ankle or he gets herpes the night before or the day of, you know, or he doesn't make weight and you're like banging your head against, well, big coaching moments. If you're really going to love your guys, you're going to build into them in these big coaching moments. And they're going to see it. They'll see your genuineness. And they're going to know that you love them regardless of the results. So that's how to respond to the COVID. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> – I mean, that you, you hit on a lot of points that, you know, as a high school coach too, on top of the youth wrestling, you know, something that we constantly think about because, like you said, there's those days that, you know, the people in the stands don't know – the the two weeks that went into preparation for a tournament or what you've been working on with this kid and it just happens to be that day that things don't go right but it looks totally different to to the spectators and as a coach you're trying to process everything else that's going on so that's really really powerful <laughs> in terms of you know what we have to think about as coaches and what we keep, need to keep in mind as we we see those things happen that there is a bigger picture and we have to keep that that um, message in mind too that we really got to live what we preach a lot too. So there's days that kids don't have a, a good tournament or something like that or a bad match. And we just have to make sure we keep finding those little things to keep building on that. So that's definitely um, really, really big. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually in the process of um, working with Craig Sesker, who's a, a fairly decent name in the world of sports writing, especially with wrestling. And we're working on a book together called not all roads lead to gold. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of kind of encapsulates kind of what I went through in my athletic career, some of the injuries, some of the up moments, some of the down moments, and knowing that, listen, I'm not going to let one bad moment or a bunch of bad moments ruin the joy or what I got out of the sport of wrestling. I mean, I'm a better, I'm a better version. I tell people all the time, if it weren't for Jesus and wrestling, I'd be in prison, honestly, because I grew up in a broken home. My dad was an alcoholic for 40 years. There were times that we, we lived in the inner city. We bounced around moving from place to place. Mm. I did not have a life that, you know, I didn't come out of some, you know, easy middle class environment. There were a time where, you know, we were in between apartments or semi homeless and living with one of my mom's friends just so we weren't out on the street. And so, you know, I look at what the sport of wrestling did for me, even though my parents got divorced, wrestling kind of brought us back together. That was a really cool part. And I see, I see sports sometimes tearing families apart. Mm -hmm. The sport brought our family back together. It was amazing. It was really cool. So I, we, like I said, we're, I'm in the process of writing a book to help kids and parents and coaches kind of get that. We talk about, it's all about the journey, mm -hmm. but is it really, you know, and how we got to live that out, you know, in these big moments. That's going to be uh, definitely something that I know Adam and myself and a lot of the other coaches are going to look forward to seeing to come out. Cause that's always something too, that we, you know, we're, we're trying to communicate. So um, before we get into your background, Adam, why don't we open up for a couple of questions? I know I saw a couple pop up here in the chat. Um, so just kind of going back to, you know, your family and things like that, and obviously your experience. So, um, let's see, uh, Who do we want? Benny, Benny, yeah. you ready? I, I'm going to unmute Benny and I'm going to have him start his video. There we go. Hey, Benny. Hi. All right. What was our question? Do any of your kids wrestle? You know what? They wrestle me, but they <laughs> are not, right? Uh, so there's times where I've got seven kids piled up. And, you know, the nice thing about it is I'm still stronger than all of them put together. <laughs> um, and that's one of the things now. I just hit 50. I just turned 50 um, on June 9th. So I, I got to stay in shape because if I don't, they're going to try to usurp my authority and overthrow me as king of our household. But no, <laughs> My son dabbled in wrestling a little bit through eighth grade, and then he we just lifted together his freshman, sophomore, and junior year in high school, and then he decided as a senior he's going to come back out for wrestling. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to encourage him to spend one year of it with me in college because it'll be a different experience for him. Um, but I don't know. It's not anything I force my kids to do because I understand. I, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked with little kids, and I've worked with Olympic-level athletes, and I've wrestled as a little kid all the way to an Olympic-level athlete. And so I know the commitment, and I know, like, in anything in life, that if, you're, if you don't love what you do, I mean, you, if you would have asked me, Coach, was there ever a time in your life where you didn't think that you should wrestle? I would look at you like, are you out of your mind? I always wanted to wrestle. <laughs> It was never a question. I was going to wrestle in high school. I was going to wrestle in college. And I never thought about stopping wrestling. It just, it, it was one of those things where I'm like, no, I'm going to wrestle. I was 38 years old when I won my last national tournament. I mean, I was old enough to actually compete at the veterans age. There was an age group. I was actually old enough to be a veteran wrestler. And I would get teased about it. Like, old man, where's your cane? And I'm like, I'll show you. <laughs> and so it's just one of those things. No, I, I, I'm not going to force anybody into it. I encouraged my son to do it. He's like, dad, it's not for me. And I was like, okay, I get it. He's going to have passions in other areas. The kid's an egghead, right? He got a 1560 on his SAT. He didn't study for it. Now it's 1600. So he's a super genius. He's yeah. Yeah. But, but that's it. But we live together and we bond <laughs> in other things. You know? I, I play video games with him. We play super smash or we play, you know, uh, heroes of the storm for a while, but I'm a little bit of a nerd as well, which is okay. You can be a nerd as long as you're a physically fit nerd. Well, that was going to be our other question is what was your favorite computer game? Because we were doing some research on you and it said you like to play computer games. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things I'm, I'm going to have to admit that for a while, I was a World of Warcraft addict. I was oh. on one of the best guilds in the country. We we're doing all the high level gyms. It, it was, but it got to the point where I was about to have my, I think it was our fourth kid. I was working on my master's and I decided to make another run at the 2008 Olympics. So I'm like, ah, I guess this is going to have to go. I can't spend. You can give that up. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, it was, a, it was, it was that or lose my family, end up in divorce court and on the street. So I didn't want yeah. to. Yeah. 
I think I you do. chose right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do like video games. I still do. I mean, you know, every so once in a while I'll walk by, like, there's like an older Pac-Man machine. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I could still beat the old Pac-Man. <laughs> awesome. What do we say? Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Benny. Awesome, awesome question, Benny. You know, Coach, we're starting up a girls program if any of your daughters want to give it a try this fall. You're welcome. I've got a couple that have the right attitude. Um, they're, full, they're, they're apple that did not fall from the tree. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. They're behind you right now making faces, just so you know. Yeah, one of my oldest daughter. So my son is the oldest, and I've got six girls after that. And so my oldest daughter is uh, behind me with her phone plugged in. So you may see her head now and again looking at yeah. me. If you see a knife, warn me. <laughs> that will do will do <laughs> awesome so obviously you've mentioned it already you know your background is what it is but just kind of talk us through you know you've competed on the biggest stage in the world you know where, where I think anybody that wants to pursue wrestling past the high school level that and you know they get in collegiately that's kind of you know I think a goal that they put on their plate a little bit so just kind of talk us through what was it like competing in the Olympics and, and kind of that process of going through it too. Cause you know, obviously you're not the only guy that has that dream. So. Yeah. So I think, so the process is brutal. Mm -hmm. Let's just be honest. I mean, there are days where you have to understand because, you know, I think when I first started wrestling, it was kind of fun because you're playing games. That's what it should be for a little kid, right? You shouldn't be playing mostly games. You shouldn't be doing five hour practices and, you know, competing a hundred matches a year. That's just insane. It's, it's actually killing the sport. Um, but as you get older, I mean, by the time you get to high school, it's a, it's a lot less fun, but it's more enjoyable. And I say that because you're always straining and you're always coming, you should be coming out of situations where your 100% is getting incrementally better. And then by the time that you get to your college, there's very few fun things about college wrestling. It's mostly pain and enjoyment because you enjoy the battle, right? And if you really enjoy the battle, those painful moments, you know, if I get through this, that's something that somebody else maybe didn't do, right? And so I'm going to get – and then by the time you get to the Olympic level, you know, it, 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 it hurts. It hurts to win. I mean, it hurts more to win sometimes than it does to lose. I mean, think about it. You go out there and you text someone. You're breathing hard because you did all the work. They just got tacked. They're, they didn't, what did they do? They just got thumped on their head a couple of times. They're not, they're not tired. They're not hurting. And then those big matches that you lose three to two where, I mean, you're – you left everything out there. You feel like you're about to die where you were killing yourself. Like a part of you died out there and then you lost on top of it. And, and it, like you were telling your body, your body's screaming, I'm about to die. And you're like, shut up and do your job. And then you still lose the match and yet you walk away and say, that was a battle. Like I had so many matches like that with Dennis Hall. Some of my favorite moments were, were at, at, at the time they were just so, they were, they were painful. It was awful. Most people can't even fathom the kind of pain that you go through to get there. And then you're in this huge moment, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people watching you and you lose. Right. And yet when you reflect on it, you're like, that was magnificent. That gave something people to talk about. I lost and that sucked. And I'm going to go back to the drawing board and I'm going to get better. But that was glorious. That was enjoyable. So I, I hope I answered your question on what it's like uh, well, because did. it, 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 it's painful and yes, it's enjoyable. I, I look back at it and someone said, someone asked me once, if you had to go through everything that you had to go, everything and the results would say the exact same, you wouldn't get any better. I'm like, absolutely. I would go through it again because it was awesome. It made me who I am today. I wouldn't, I mean, God used the sport of wrestling to make me who I am today. And some, some of that was getting hurt and learning compassion. I didn't have a whole lot of compassion when I was an athlete. And when I got hurt, all of a sudden I had to learn compassion. It was or it was either that or admit that I was weak. And sometimes you just get hurt. And what does that look like? So, yeah. Now, did you ever have to, kind of a follow-up question to this, did you ever have to feel like you had to prove something coming from a different background than, you know, a lot of the athletes that you typically see on Olympic teams where they had the Division One experience? Did you ever feel like you were kind of battling from the bottom and you had to prove it to all these guys? Or did you just go in with a all-in mindset? Every single day of my life, mm -hmm. when I got there, I was the only non- I mean, it was one of there, uh, one of the guys, there's a couple of D2 guys, but like Roderick Lee was like a three-time national D2 champ mm -hmm. and was competitive. I mean, he beat Zeke Jones when Zeke Jones was at his like peak and Broderick went out there and beat him because he was just a sick athlete, right? 
Um, no, yeah, I always felt like I'm that guy from that school that had 450 students, including the grad school, and what are you even doing here? You got in because Mike Houck was an assistant coach at Maranatha, and that's how you got in. So I felt like I had to prove myself every day. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that that helped with, too, is some of these D1 guys weren't making great life decisions. And I wasn't the best athlete in the room, but I was somebody that was making more right decisions in both my personal life. That's something that I hammer on kids all the time. Listen, you think that you can live your life the way you want. How's that working out for you? And you think that you can go, some of these guys were going out and not even just weekends, but during the week and they were coming back the next day and they smelled like a brewery. Well, mm -hmm. how's that making you a better athlete? It's just not. And even if you look at it from a scientific nutritional standpoint, alcohol replaces water in your body, which means it dehydrates you. That's, we know from wrestling, being dehydrated sucks. So why do it in an artificial way? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there was a lot. I mean, I was all in, but I'm, 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 I, I, I felt like which one of these doesn't belong and all arrows were pointing at this guy right here. And so I felt like, I, I always felt like I always had to prove myself because I came from that non-traditional Olympic level background. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a question for you uh, from one of our uh, athletes. William, you want to come on? What the? Uh, <laughs> William. We'll change the, uh, your background yeah. photo. <laughs> <laughs> you want to ask your question, Will? Um, where did you wrestle in the Olympics, and who did you wrestle? Oh, good, two good questions. So my first Olympics, I wrestled in Sydney. Um, I started off, I didn't have, not have an easy pool play. The first guy I wrestled, his name was Karen McCurchy, and he was about 12 feet tall, super skinny. I don't even know how we were at the same weight class. I had actually beaten him a couple of times, but that match, it was a crazy match. I was up three to zero. And in the last minute of the match, I managed to snatch almost defeat out of the jaws of victory. And he tied up the match three to three. And with one second left, I managed to escape duck under and take him down while it was clicking from six to 5.59 to six minutes. Took him down and won the match four to three. It was crazy. The next match, I had to wrestle the guy from Ukraine who had taken fourth in the Worlds the year before and had beaten Dennis Hall. And so it was a, it was a huge match. I ended up beating him four to zero. I had one of the best matches uh, of my Olympic career was at that match. And then um, I got out of my pool and then I was beating the Chinese guy one to zero. And then I decided to implode and ended up getting beaten with about, uh, about a minute and a half left in the match. I got beat 11 to one. It was probably one of the most embarrassing matches of my career because I just imploded. My second Olympics was in Greece. Um, I won my first match. I was down seven to zero. So I almost got teched. It was against the guy from Portugal. He was deaf. And the referee looked at me when I stepped on the match and said, take it easy on him. He's deaf. Well, I had wrestled this guy before. I knew he was deaf, but it kind of rattled me. It's like, you don't expect a referee to say, hey, take it easy on him. He's deaf. And so all of a sudden, I started thinking about wrestling this deaf guy. And next thing you know, I got put down. He turned me and then reverse lifted me and turned me again. I'm down seven to zero. I'm like, Grunewald, what are you doing right now? And so I went next level on the guy and was up 13 to seven and then pinned him. And then I wrestled a Romanian guy, um, and I had beaten him in a real tight match, three to two, a couple of years. And I, that was actually, um, I ended up losing to him in a match three to one. So that Olympics, I only took 10th. The first Olympics, I took six. The second Olympics, I took 10th. So those are my two Olympic experiences. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Stud. Good question, William. All right, so... You know, obviously you've been around the sport for a long time too. Um, so can you just kind of comment a little bit on, you know, how have you seen the sport change over the years? You know, obviously, and then to going from athlete through coach. Yeah, so um, as an athlete, one of the things that I noted, so just to kind of give you a perspective, when I, when I first started wrestling, I had a six-week clinic, right? I had one match as a sixth grader. In seventh grade, I had four matches. In eighth grade, I had 12 matches, but then I got into freestyle. Mm -hmm. Got teched and pinned my first two matches in freestyle because it was just different. I ended up later on at 80 pounds, won the freestyle state championship. So I made some adjustments and got better. Um, then I get to high school, right? And during a high school season, I would have on average about 30 matches. But then I would get, you know, over the years, over the summer, I would get, you know, between another 30-ish, sometimes 40 matches in. But I wanted to. I was just you know, lifting during the week and then wrestling on the weekends because my dad said, hey, kid, you want to go to a tournament? My brother and I'd be like, yeah, let's go to a wrestling tournament. So I'd be a meathead during the week and then we'd wrestle on the weekends. But now it's just like, 
it's crazy the number of matches these kids are getting in. And the, the thing that I see from an athlete standpoint is a lot of these even middle school kids are getting hundreds of matches in rather than developing themselves and their technique and so or their athletic ability. So I'm getting I'm getting guys at the college level that can't even do a good cartwheel. Right. I want guys. I want, and so for me, I, I told people if I were president of the United States. My first executive order would say that everybody must be participating in a tumbling or gymnastics class until they're 10 years old. Then they can pick a sport that they want to go into. But you've got to learn to control your body before you can be an effective wrestler. You know, how are you going to control another human being if you can't even control yourself? And so what I've seen is just kind of like this hyper competitive environment that I think to a certain degree is killing the sport. Um, and then I'm also seeing a lot of people trying to specialize where when I was a kid, I played soccer. I played base. I played baseball. I played basketball. I was a, I was a point guard in fifth and sixth grade. I was a starting point guard on the basketball team. You know, everybody hit puberty and I didn't, you know, I didn't hit puberty until I was like 25 when I first got my beard. So it was a little bit different, but they all grew and I didn't, you know, but I played just about every sport that you could play and then just settled on wrestling in high school because I realized I'm kind of too small to be the starting point guard. And I don't have like a 50 inch vertical where I can dunk the ball. So I wasn't going to be, you know, spud web. For those of you who remember Spud, Le Spud Webb, you know, the kids are like, who's that? Well, he's, you know, he's like 5'5", five, five and he could dunk. He was, a, he was a sick athlete. I, that wasn't me. You know, so I just see that. And from coaching, um, it's, it's kind of the same thing. I, 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 it, it's one of the things, too, I'm seeing a softness in, a in athletes that I don't remember um, when I was competing. In other words, it seems like we, and again, I'm all for compassion. Like I learned a lot of compassion, but one of the things that I do with my athletes is you have got to learn to get to a dark place in your life because what that's going to do is help you in those dark moments. What happens if your marriage is kind of going sideways? What happens if you lose your job? How are you going to respond? Are you going to respond in anger? Are you going to say, you know what, I'm going to do what I learned in wrestling practice and I'm going to get up because I know there is light at the end of the tunnel. There's hope. And the other thing is I learned just the importance of community in wrestling, right? I'm not alone. Everybody says wrestling is an individual sport, but it's not. There's a community that's so important because you cannot be a superstar alone. So I, I, I guess one of the things that I, I, I try to build in my guys is that grit that I think that we're losing in society because of whether it be a helicopter parent where they just want to swoop in and try to fix the problems for their kids Rather than all this, I understand responsible parenting. You have a responsibility to protect your kids, but sometimes you got to kind of let them reach out when you tell them, don't touch the grill, and they don't obey you, and they touch the grill, and they burn themselves. You're like, e see, how'd that work out for you? Not great. Now, if my kid's going to walk across the street, and he's five years old, and I see a truck hurtling towards him, I'm going to grab him, you know, and pull him back in. I'm not going to let him get smushed by a truck. But there are sometimes we let our kids get hurt a little bit. They've got to learn those moments of pain because it's going to make them better. I'm not talking abuse. I'm not talking about beating my kids. I'm not talking about locking them in a cage. But I'm talking about having a experience a little bit of pain in their life so they learn that, hey, this hurt. I'm not going to do this again. But I'm going to learn from it because it may happen again, but in a different way. So that's kind of coaching my experience with the over competition mm -hmm. i've actually started cutting back some of the competition that i do even at the college level because i want i've got to focus on skill development because some of them just aren't getting it in high school mm -hmm. no definitely i mean that's especially you know with we took over uh adam coach johnson and myself we kind of came in this year um as our first year with the club but definitely just trying to communicate that let's get really, really good at a little. And then, you know, as you progress, we can expand on that, but you still always have that really strong, small arsenal that you're going to be able to score and score and score and defend and defend and defend and not have to worry about, you know, the, the, you know, the Rolodex of moves going on in your head as you're like, okay, well, what do I do here? No, I know three things. This is, you know, what I got. This is what I can do. So that's definitely powerful too. It's always good <laughs> as we do these, that we get that message reinforced so that it's, it's not just the same people saying the same things. It's other people saying the same things as well. So I think that message becomes more powerful as more and more people start to communicate that as well. So, um, and just one more uh, question here on just kind of your background. You know, you're, you're a devout Christian, firm in your faith. You're a head coach at one of the most prestigious uh, Christian schools in the country. Um, so overall, how has your faith helped shape you as a person, wrestler, coach, father, kind of how has that taken over, you know, the important aspects in your life? So that's the one thing that I'm always, when I'm 
not other things. Like there's times that I'm a dad and there's times I'm a husband, there's times that I'm a coach, right? But I'm always a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so it directs me. It makes me the best version of myself uh, uh, possible. Mm -hmm. Honestly, um, people try to look at the Bible and they don't, they don't know how to read it, number one. And so they come up with these crazy ideas or they misread it. And yet the Bible is a great book of history. It's a great book of wisdom. And there's not a thing that we're dealing with today that the Bible doesn't have an answer for. I mean, if you want to talk about a book that had promoted the fact that we're all equal in the eyes of God, all you have to do is read Rome, uh, Galatians 3.23, where it says there is no more Jew, there is no more Gentile, there is no more male, there is no more female. That when God looks at us spiritually, there's going to be physical differences, right? I'm two feet tall. But that doesn't make me less valuable than an NBA basketball player who's, you know, 6'9", right? Mm -hmm. You know, height isn't a qualifier for value. Now, it may, may make me a more valuable basketball player, but if you talk about someone's intrinsic value, well, my Christianity tells me that whether someone has an IQ of 100 or 200, whether they're male or female, whether they're black or some variation of brown, that we are all valuable in the eyes of God, that Christ did the same thing for all of us. So that that really drives who I am as a coach. It drives who I am as a husband and as a father, as a neighbor. Mm -hmm. It means that if I see my neighbor, my neighbor the other day was struggling with something and I knew how to do it. So I walked over there. It was at the end of the day, end of a workout. I just showered. I didn't want to get sweaty again. He didn't, he didn't know how to do something. I went over there and for an hour, I worked tossing you know some dirt and getting an area ready and I got a full sweat again and I had to go into it. But you want to know what? We became close because of that, because I stepped out of what I wanted to do, which is to sit down and relax, and it made me be a better person. Well, I, I wouldn't have done that if I was a Christian. Right. You know, It drove me to say, okay, what would Christ do in this moment? Mm -hmm. He would say, love your neighbor. How am I going to love my neighbor right now? It means digging some dirt. And I, I listen, I'll be honest, I didn't want to do it, but I got to love my neighbor more than I love myself. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what it is. And that means uh, when I get a kid in my program – who, you know, maybe doesn't have parents that are together. I can love on him and love him the way men should love other men, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of discipleship love that's going to point him towards God and Christ. I'm going to love young ladies who are God. And I tell my guys all the time, until you're man enough to put a ring on a young lady's finger, keep your hands off of her. Don't do something stupid. Don't be another statistic about a, somebody who gets pregnant out of wedlock because you know what? It doesn't really do for your do well for your success in life. I've seen wrestling careers ruin, ruined because of it. And then I know it's a hard thing to hear. Guys will be like, what do you think about holding hands? I'm like, listen, I'm 50 years old, and when I hold my wife's hand, it still fires me up. Maybe I'm a weirdo, but I like women, and I love my wife, right? So – my suggestion is, I know handing, hold a hand isn't a big deal, and you're not going to get her pregnant doing it, but just be careful because it's a start. So it's just any, anything. I mean, it doesn't make a difference what it is. There's wisdom in the Word of God that is going to help people live their lives better. Mm -hmm. And they can't cherry pick certain parts of the Bible that they don't understand and say, well, what about this? You know, and they'll try to use that, like, and this is kind of big right now, but slavery. Well, the slavery of the Old Testament was different than the slavery we had when our country was first starting. Completely different. People put themselves in the positions like that because they didn't have credit cards. If you got into debt, you had to pay off that debt. And then after seven years, if they hadn't paid off the debt, you were supposed to forgive the debt and let them go free. Or they could choose to stay that way and say, hey, listen, I like what I got going here. I want to work for you for the rest of my life. It was more of an in you know, indentured servant than it was what we have there. Slavery is wrong. We know that. Controlling another human being and treating them as property is wrong. And you're going to find that in the Bible. In fact, the Bible very clearly calls slave trading a sin. You weren't supposed to treat people like a like property. That's absurd. In anything else, women's rights. You're going to see some solid women's rights in the Bible. It's there for those who want to read it, but they want to cherry pick things that they don't understand. So that was kind of a long answer, but my faith drives who I am. It makes me, it makes me more intense. It makes me more savage. It makes me a better dad. It just on anything. It doesn't make a difference what it is. It just makes me better. Now that's very, <laughs> I keep using the word powerful, but it is. I mean, because obviously, you know, the message coming from, you know, somebody with your caliber and your background and, and, and your knowledge base, it definitely does, it, it carries a more meaningful tune um, as we go along here. So uh, we're going to kind of transition here into a little bit, just some uh, advice and info that you can have for our wrestlers. So um, 
just kind of our first general question is, you know, obviously you've gotten to the, the highest level. What advice would you have for our wrestlers that do aspire to do that? What would be, what would that track kind of be like? Okay. So it's simple. You have got to, you got to make right decisions. Mm -hmm. And the only reason you're going to make a right decision is you're going to be serving something greater than yourself. So I'm going to circle back to, it was easier for me to make right decisions because I knew that God always had an eye on me, you know, whether it was in the practice room or behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. So I had to, I learned that I was serving something greater than myself. You have to find something greater than yourself to be able to make that choices. It can't be mom and dad, because even though they're greater than you, what happens is though, if you're just doing this to please mom and dad, it's not the right reason. And so it's really about making wise choices. But listen, let's be honest, you can make all the best choices in the world and still just be a 500 wrestler. You know, part of it is, part of it is athletic ability. Mm -hmm. Part of it's doing what other people are unwilling to do. Like for instance, three times a week after a wrestling practice at the Olympic Training Center, I said, I'm going to do 100 pull-ups. I don't care what they look like, but I have to do 100 pull-ups in three sets. So I would finish a practice, and it couldn't be in the beginning when I was fresh. It had to be at the end. It had to be when I didn't want to do it. I hated it. And I would run over to that pull-up bar, and I would do 100 pull-ups in three sets. And if I got 100 pull-ups in three sets, victory. All right? That was me winning the national tournament. I had guys walking by me to get a drink because the, the pull-up bar was right next to the water fountain. They're like, you ain't going all the way down. And there's a part of me that would be like, who are you? You're not even doing them. Right. You're not even doing them, and you're criticizing me. But I keep my mouth shut. I do my pull-ups, and come nationals time, when I won and they lost, or I was in the finals again and they weren't, I would remember them saying, "Hey, you weren't going down far enough. What? Well, you want to know what? Fine, fine, fine. Maybe you're right. Maybe I need to. Maybe I got to be a little bit more honest with my pull-ups. But you ain't doing them. Mm -hmm. And so it's about making right decisions. It's about doing things that other people are unwilling to do. It's about this much. Because there are very few superstars in our sport. I've been around them. I've wrestled them. I've gotten my butt kicked by some of them. But you want to know what? If you do this, if, if it's this much and you keep doing this much better, it is amazing how quickly you can close the gap when they make wrong decisions. So I made world Olympic teams mm -hmm. over better athletes, over more gifted athletes, because I did this much better. I had to scratch and claw my way to the top. Um, a lot of people are hoping that they're going to be that superstar that's going to tech their, and pin their way through the Olympics. And I've seen that. Our men Nazarian teched his way through the Olympics, crushed people in 2000. He had one close match, wrecked everybody else. He, he, he folded the guy in half in the finals. That's one guy. The rest of us, we scratch and claw our way to the top. And it's not doing anything illegal. Mm -hmm. You make good choices, but you got to make right good choices to get to the top so our next question here comes from colvin he's on the screen now unfortunately their mic isn't working so colvin you can wave hi now hey colvin uh, coach jim behind him his dad he's one of our coaches as well cool uh, valley so his question is um you know obviously you are a fan of upper body and kind of the russian series but are there any techniques or drills or strategies that you think um, our kids in the club should be focusing on Okay, so I'm a friend of Jordan Burroughs. Mm -hmm. Jordan Burroughs is gifted by God. He's freak strong. He's freak fast. He's freak talented. He's a freak hard worker. So he has everything that you need to be a superstar, right? I mean, we've seen the guy shoot from his knees three feet away and finish techniques in the world championships and tech people. Right, he broke his ankle a month before his his world championship, and, and and crushed everybody. I'm not Jordan Burroughs. I don't have everything that he was gifted and be a hard worker. Now I'm a hard worker, but I'm not gifted the way he's gifted. And so for the for us mere mortals, us human beings, you have to learn to hand fight, two on ones, underhooks, collar ties, front headlocks. Because you can't shoot from distance. You've got to learn to use two-on-ones and underhooks and collar ties as setups to get to the body and to the legs. And if you're not doing that, I'm telling you right now, you will never maximize what you could be as a wrestler without, without being 100% sold out in hand fighting. Because it will help you 
get to those legs. It will help you get to his body and do things that other people will never be able to do because they think that they're fast enough to shoot and they shoot and they get their head stuffed. They get spun around behind and they're the guy that comes up to you and talks about how they lost the match in the last two seconds and that's why they didn't go to state. That's exactly <laughs> kind of the mindset and the, the theme that we keep trying to communicate as well. So that's really, really good. So yeah, and just to be 100% forthright, this is not a pre-scripted conversation. You no. asked a question. You didn't tell me, hey, Jim, when you get on, say this, please. Make us look good, right? No, none of that happened. It was you asking the question and me telling you what I know as a coach. It's coach Pee Wee Kids Wrestling, and the first thing I teach them, here's how you hand fight. If you can beat a person up without having to take a shot, how beautiful is that? You can break a people, a person with hand fighting and not ever have to take a bad shot. Or you can not listen to me, take a bad shot, and I will ask you one question. How's that working out for you? You say, you're a jerk. You're right. I am a jerk. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little jerk. <laughs> uh, that's <laughs> – so, <laughs> sorry. That's just – it's <laughs> – <laughs> at, the high school, at the high school level too it's it's simplicity at its finest but it's efficiency at its finest too and I mean I think it's just you know to be able to hear that and to be able to see that and you know you, you look at those matches of those guys you know even at the collegiate level you know you, you, if you watch the NCAAs or you go to a college duel they're doing those little things too it's not flashy it's not fancy but they're working their butts off in those close tight positions to be able to get to what they need to. And that's when they're able to get to their high efficiency, they're able to score, and they're able to control matches. So that's just, <laughs> it's just awesome hearing these things as well. So um, kind of wrapping up here, uh, for our athletes, if you had to pick kind of three big pieces of advice, and I know you've kind of mentioned a lot of things, but if you were to kind of put it into these three things, what would they be in terms of, just success on and off the mat because that's our message as the club is that we want to be champions on the mat and off the mat yeah so thing number one and I don't know that these are in any uh list of importance but thing number one is listen to your coach all right because we've all heard the expression if at first you don't succeed try try again right we've heard that it's the dumbest expression in the history of mankind or at least in the top 10 it's don't if at first you don't succeed try try again no if at first you don't succeed do what your coach told you to do the first time or do what your teacher told you to do the first time or do what your parent told you to do the first time. So listen to your coach because 99.9% .9 of the time, if you listen to your coach, probably something good to happen. And if, and if you listen to your coach and something bad happened, well, it's on him, not on you. And you can figure that out together and work on it and say, hey, coach, this doesn't seem right. And he coach, you're right. That wasn't right. So let's get better. I got better. You got better. So listen to your coach. And then the number two, kind of hand in hand, you heard me say this before, you have got to make right decisions. You can't do dumb things like go to a party. You cannot be drinking in high school. I think dating is dumb in a high school. I mean, you're not emotionally ready for it. You might, you might have all the parts, whoop de doo You got the parts, congratulations, but you don't have the emotional or the mental, or you don't have anything remotely capable of being able to handle a relationship in high school. And you hear those kids like, well, what about so-and-so who got married to their high school sweetheart? So you're going to take the one in 10 million person and you're going to model your life at that. How about the other nine, you know, the, the other gazillion people who dated five, 5,000 times in high school and the relationships never worked out. Mm -hmm. So it's dumb. So make right choices. Listen to your coach, make right choices. And the, the other one is probably it, it, it is something that you would normally, you've got to follow good nutritional advice. Because you can listen to your coach, you can make right choices, and if you're not following good nutrition, you're not getting the sleep that you need, you're not eating the food that you eat, you're not getting the water in your body, you can do everything right for 364 days of the year and you show up to the state tournament, you step on the scale, and you blew it all in the next minute or two in your rehydration because you don't know how to sip and nibble. Mm -hmm. So listen to your coaches, make right choices, and follow proper nutrition. And nutrition includes sleep, it includes hydration, it includes what you put. Listen, we all know, we all know that if I put orange juice into a car, what's gonna happen to that car? It's not gonna work, yeah. It's not gonna work, right? Because orange juice, even though it might be good for us, sucks as fuel for a car. Mm -hmm. Any more than I can drink, you like, wow, this car runs really fast in this gasoline, I better drink this gasoline. We die. Yeah. You gotta give your, your body the tools that it needs to repair itself. 
So you've got to eat healthy. And if you don't know what that looks like, email me at Wheaton College. I'll give you a list of bullet points of good nutritional tips that I, that I, I preach every year to my team and to the campus community. And USA Wrestling even, even has, has, has promoted some of my stuff in their magazine on nutrition because it is so important. All right, everybody listening, you heard it here. You can email him, get that advice. So, Do it. I'm uh, not scared. We have a couple more questions here from our fan base. <laughs> uh, so, Jacob, do you want to hop on? Jacob. All right. We got the Jens boys. What's your favorite color of your car? What's that? No. What's your favorite color of your car? Uh, well, that goes. Uh, so, uh, so behind you and, and you do a color of a Jacob in the face? No, he wanted you to do a cartwheel. <laughs> you wanted me to do a cartwheel? Uh, I, I really don't have the room to do a cartwheel. How about I do this, though? How about that? Boom. There you go. There you go. Bigger than your head, kid. <laughs> uh, William, do you want to hop on again? Oh, can, I do it? can I go? Yeah, you got one more question? Oh. Oh, there we go. There you go. Go ahead, William. Um, what foods do you eat before a match? Ooh, that's a really good question. Okay, so as a college coach, okay, so so depending on how much weight, and I'm not a real big fan of cutting weight because you can't get huge in one hour or in two hours, right? So normally the, the, the what I say is you should be within – seven pounds of what you practice at. So if I weigh like 125 pounds is my weight class, I should be in practice at about 132 because I can lose that weight pretty easily in a practice or a couple of days, right? And be smart, just kind of diet down to it. And then I'm going to step on the scale. So what you need to do immediately after weigh-ins is you've got to find something that is going to sit well in your stomach. For some people, it's Gatorade. For some people, it's, it's, it's vitamin water. For some people, it's Powerade. There's a lot of really good sports drinks out there. Sometimes you've got to dilute it a little bit. Just water isn't great because you, your body also needs calories. Because a lot of times when you're dropping your weight, you're at a calorie deficit. and Your body needs a little bit of energy. So my big thing is you've got to sip your calories after weigh-in and eat things that are light because if you eat too much what happens is your body pulls all the blood about 50 percent of it and it puts it right around your belly now do we want our blood around our belly when we're about to compete no we want our blood in our muscles right so that our muscles are working so you have to eat light and you've got to i, I always recommend drink your calories Okay, and when you drink, sip. Because if you try guzzling it, you're gonna have like a, you're gonna have a big bloated stomach, and you're probably gonna throw up. And I've seen a lot of a lot of even elite level athletes do that. So you want to sip things. You want to sip your calories. Fruit snacks are good. You know, if you've got like a full two hours in a tournament, maybe like a light granola bar. If you have like if when I was at the senior nationals, we would have like the semifinals at ten o'clock, and and then our the finals wouldn't start until like eight o'clock at night. I could go out and have a full meal because I had a full four hours for my food to digest. So if you've got like two a full two hours, you could even have like a small sandwich, but you don't want to eat everything that's going to be super heavy. So I always kept it really light. Does that help? Yeah. Good. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, stud. All right, I think we got two more questions. Uh, one from Connor and then one from uh, Benny's going to hop back on. So, Connor, you want to ask your question? I have a question. Tell me right there. What's your favorite move? My favorite what? What's your favorite move? My favorite move. Well, my athletes would tell you that it's smashing their face with a front headlock so when i do a front headlock i don't go around the throat i go around the face and i'll snap them down and i'll take this forearm bone right here and i'll put it right across their face and i'll lock it up and they feel like their skull is about to shatter and it's because it is because i'm strong enough to actually crush a grown man's skull and then they'll go to their back for me which is really nice i just encourage them to go but that's actually not my favorite move it just works really well for me now because I don't sprawl as well as I need to, so I have to have a, a front headlock to be able to encourage people not to shoot on me. I actually, when I was competing, my favorite move in Greco was a gut wrench, okay? And my favorite move on my feet was a slide by. I would lift up on one arm and I would drop my head and I would attack their body. That was my favorite move. Very cool. In, in, in high school, it was a fireman's carry. 
love the fireman's carry. Fireman's Ooh, carry yeah, yeah. is one of the most underrated moves ever. People always say fireman's carry isn't a high level move, but you want to know what? I watched a guy, was it uh, three or four years ago now, win a world championships with a fireman's carry. So for any of all the haters out there on fireman's carry, they don't even know what they're talking about. Fireman's carry is a legit move. That's Connor's favorite move. Good, good, good. Insta back points. All right, we got another question? Yeah. All right. Uh, who was your toughest opponent? Oh, so now, do you mean the, my toughest opponent? Because let, let's define our terms because words are important. Do you mean the best person I ever wrestled as far as their athletic ability or the guy who was the toughest? I knew when I was going into that match, it was going to be a war. So do you want tough or do you want talented? What do you want? Tough. Tough? Dennis Hall. <laughs> Dennis Hall. We wrestled against each other for 15 years. Every match that we had was a war. There was no quarter ass, none given. We battled so hard. You can watch, I think all three of my 2000 Olympic trials matches are on YouTube now. I think USA Wrestling posted those. If you want to see three matches that were just absolute war and battle, go and watch those matches. Those are kind of like my three favorite matches of all my wrestling career and even the one that I lost. I watched that match that I lost again, and it gets me all fired up, and I want to wrestle him all over again. Yeah, so <laughs> Dennis Hall was easily the toughest person I ever wrestled. Guy was a stud. All right, how about the other? No? You, you want another question? I'll give you another question. What was the other one? Oh, I was just going to say, how about then the best? The best would be Armen Nazarian. He was a two-time Olympic champ. He was the guy that I actually dislocated my shoulder the first time I was wrestling. We were in the semis of the world championships. It was one-to-one -one tie, and I got put down. I shouldn't have because I was pushing him all over the mat, but those foreign refs got me, and I missed a moment, and he threw me, and I tried floating myself, and I dislocated my shoulder. But that guy was just a supremely gifted athlete. He was the one that teched his way through the 2000 Olympics. He was amazing, but I caught up to him because of the, the choices that I made. And then I got hurt and then I learned mm -hmm. compassion. So the best thing about that match, as much as it was the only time in my, well, it's the second time in my life, but it only happened twice in my 30 year career that I ever didn't finish a match. And that was the first time. And I walked off in it. It, it, it made me a better person because I look back at it. It made me a more compassionate person and it helped me to be a better father because of it and a better coach uh, was to learn compassion. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Appreciate the question. All right. So we're going to wrap up here. One more final parting word of wisdom. So we, we, we had our message for our wrestlers. We always like to end with a message for our dad slash coaches because obviously, you know, we're, we're all involved because we love the sport and we're trying to get our sons involved in the sport. And, you know, we're just trying to build that big. We, we have our hashtag on Twitter um, and on Facebook, our FVWC family. So what would be kind of one piece of parting knowledge or advice for the dad slash coaches that we have in terms of, you know, what we can do to really make this the best possible club? Be genuine. It's super, it's, you know, right, right? That's super simple, but it's not easy. It's one of those things where your kids will know if winning is the only thing that you're concerned about. And you can't make it about the winning. It can't be about the losing or the winning. It always has to be about you helping them become the best version of themselves possible. If you make it about winning and losing, you will ruin your relationship with your kids. And I've seen that played out time and time again. And the thing of it is, is when I was at wrestling camps and I would have, and especially with father and son camps, one of the little things that I did with the father and son camp, because I would watch them for a little bit in the first part of the session when they're working with their kid, they would get impatient if the kid wouldn't do it the right way. And then I would say, okay, dads, I want you to switch it up, work with someone else's kid. It was amazing how patient people got with other people's kids, right? And so all of a sudden, and then I would have them go back to their own kid and I would stop them and I would call it on them because I'm a jerk, right? And I'll say, hey, I just watched you be super sensitive, super compassionate, super technical. You broke things down. You were understandable. You walked through them. You didn't just say, hey, just do it. Why aren't you doing it the way you showed it? right? Sometimes we lose our minds when it's our own kids, rather than being that kind of patient, compassionate guy that you need to be, because you know that you can't get away with browbeating someone else's kids because the dad's going to go over there and give you the what for. Yeah. So be genuine. 
-hmm. Be genuine. When you feel yourself starting to get impatient, have maybe one of the other dads come over and work with your kid and you go over and work with their kid. Switch it up a little bit. I'll tell you what. Then you were like, you know what? I was being a little bit of a jerk to my kid. This isn't what he needs right now. And then the other thing is be a dad when you're supposed to be a dad and be a coach when you're supposed to be a coach. When you're at home, don't be a coach at home. Be a dad at home. Now, when you're at wrestling practice, don't be a dad. You know, if he gets he gets a little bit beat up in practice, be the coach. Encourage him as a coach would, not the way a dad would. When you're at home, now you can put on your dad hat and be all in as a dad. And it's the same thing for any parent watching this, right? Because we have a lot of armchair quarterbacks out there, parents, right? Here's, here's some of the best advice I got from our football coach. He said, Jim, coaches got a coach. Parents got a parent. Athletes got to be athletes. If someone else tries to do someone else's job, there's going to be a problem. So coach is coach, parents, parent, athletes are athletes. And if we all do that and be respectful, we'll be fine. Definitely. So uh, we really, really appreciate you coming on, coach. You know, we, everything you said here tonight, very, very powerful stuff. Very, hopefully it resonated. You know, we love having the guys come on and ask those questions and just get that, get that experience to kind of pick the brain of some of the greats. So we really, really appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things, too, is it, it, it's not like I'm telling you something you don't already know. Sure. Maybe there's like little grains here and there from my perspective, but I say that to people all the time. You know, I've had it where I taught, you know, one of my guys in my wrestling room, I taught him a move for three years. It never stuck. Tim Fader comes in, who's a wildly successful coach at Whitewater and at Lacrosse and the Whitewater. Now he's at Eau Claire, and he's going to build that program up. Fader came in and showed my guy the same exact thing. He did it slightly differently, and all of a sudden, the, my, my guy comes up and he's like, "Hey, coach, I just learned this. You see what Fader taught us?" And a couple of other my guys looked at him and said, "Mark, you idiot! Coach has been showing you that for years." And I'm like, "Hey, hey, it's not a big deal as long as they get it." Mm -hmm. So sometimes. It's just a different voice, right? So right now, I'm a different personality. I'm a different voice. It may be saying the same things in a slightly different way. And all of a sudden, the kid's like, oh, that makes sense. And you're sitting back there and you're like, you little knob. I've been saying that to you for 10 years, and now it makes sense? Because that little midget said it, that dancing monkey said it, now you get it? Well, that's fine, right? It's just a different voice. And so I've learned to swallow my pride as a coach. And as long as my guys get it, whether it's from me or somebody else, I found out this isn't a popularity contest. This is, am I being a part of the process of making this young man the best version or this young lady the best version of themselves possible? Mm -hmm. So that's what it comes down to. I just got to take my pride out of the equation. Check my ego at the door because you know it's going to get stomped on if you don't. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. So Coach Hoger, you got anything? Parting knowledge? Nope. That's all the knowledge I need. I absorbed it today. Good. Good deal. Well, we, again, we really, really appreciate you, Coach, being able to come on and meet with us. Coach Johnson, thank you for being able to set this up. I know you got your boys climbing all over you right now. but <laughs> I just want to say thanks. Really appreciate it. You were awesome. Uh, yeah, anytime. I sent it on a mass text. I said I might have a new man crush. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, right. you would say every, everything that we've, we've tried to preach it does, it does make a difference on community. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. No problem. All right, Coach. Well, you take it easy. Stay safe during this. Uh, hopefully, you know, uh, everything kind of calms down in your household and you keep going going well. And then, uh, you know, as we get through this, we look forward to seeing the success you guys have at Wheaton. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. I love talking with people yeah. about this. Thank you so much. <laughs> have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely, Benny. William, thank you guys for coming on. Thank you, guys. This has been really awesome. Thanks for setting it up. No problem. Thank you for joining. Yeah, you're rock stars. Hi. Benny, <laughs> William, thanks for asking those questions. Colin, I know you're on there. Thanks for asking those questions. Good job. This is really awesome, guys. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.